Welcome to this uh, session, an interactive session on Internet Without Borders. I'm Rick Sammons, a uh, managing board member of the World Economic Forum. I simply want to say as a welcome to the session that this is not a uh, one-off, standalone conversation. It's a link to a, a process uh, of dialogue as well as concrete work as one of our global challenge initiatives, this one on the future of the Internet. That uh, initiative, which launched uh, formally last year, is a multi-stakeholder effort to strengthen cooperation in multiple dimensions of this issue where you really do need, we all need, some degree of deeper cooperation and solution finding. Fragmentation emerged right at the beginning as one of the fundamental uh, issues, challenges uh, facing this field, and the forum as part of that initiative is dedicated to trying to help strengthen dialogue, trust, and identify areas of cooperation. So we look very much forward to this conversation as it will be an input into that process uh, going forward. I would like to say that one of the pieces of work which will be released later this week is in fact, as far as we can tell, the first rigorous overview of the various dimensions by which fragmentation and the internet is playing out. The lead author, Professor William Drake, is with us in the front row over there. He, his co-authors were Vince Cerf, one of the fathers of the Internet, as well as German Professor Wolfgang Kleinwater. With that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to you, Stephen Adler, who's president and editor of Thomson Reuters. Great. Thank you very much, and, and welcome, everybody. Um, I should point out that this session is on the record, um, and it's also um, being... Um, People are talking about it on Twitter. We certainly hope so. And you can follow along using the hashtag digital economy, one word. If, if this, this would be quite a weird session if we didn't have the ability to follow along on Twitter. Um, so I, I assume that most people here probably agree that, a, uh, that an open and uh, free internet is a good thing, at, at least in theory, that it's critical to global growth and to greater economic uh, equity. Uh, I like to quote Tim Berners-Lee, always feel like you're on safe ground when you do, and, and he's here this week. Um, the way he put it is that the laws of the internet should work like the laws of physics, with the web providing the same user experience to one user as to another wherever in the world. And indeed, uh, what we've been talking about at this uh, conference, the fourth industrial revolution, uh, interconnectedness seems to be um, you know, particularly important as a driver of the fourth industrial revolution. And you could argue that a borderless internet is really more essential than ever in this environment and that it should in some sense be non-negotiable. Yet it's nothing if not negotiable and it's certainly under threat. Uh, the internet is being fragmented among other things by technological overload and decay, vastly different capabilities in different parts of the world, political pressure with some countries seeing, seeking more sovereignty over the web within their borders as opposed to the multi-stakeholder model, uh, government censorship through blocking sites, restricting searches, uh, instituting cyber attacks against sites, um, and commercial interests clearly have, uh, have, a, have reasons to want the Internet to be fragmented in certain ways, either to control data, to charge different access rates uh, to different tiers of customers, or to segment access uh, to services among territories. So there are a lot of things fragmenting uh, the Internet, and I think one thing that's worth noting is many of them are intentional. People have interests in the fragmentation, and they're not merely inadvertent. Um, and therefore, achieving an Internet without borders really resol uh, involves resolving con conflicting claims and conflicting demands and building a consensus among both public and private stakeholders, not just fixing things that might otherwise be broken. And therefore, there's also limits to how much can be done, and I'm sure we'll talk about what are the edge of those, edges of those limits today. Uh, this has consequences in the realm of free speech and dissent, uh, bridging the digital divide, enabling the free flow of commerce, and driving growth in this fourth in industrial revolution. So there's really a tough battle, a tough challenge in the works. Uh, it's very much in progress, and today's panelists are uh, especially in the thick of it. We have a very strong panel to talk about this today. Um, starting here is uh, Andrews Ansip, who's Vice President and Commissioner for the Digital Single Market of the European Commission, so right smack in the middle of this. Um, Jose Alvar uh, Maria Alvarez Payete, Chief Operating Officer of Telefonica. Um, and um, and uh, Chandra Sikaran, uh, also known as Chandra, CEO and Managing Director of Tata Consultancy Services. Uh, Brad Smith, who's President and Chief Legal Officer of Microsoft. Um, and of course, um, Penny Pritzker, U.S. Secretary of Commerce and longtime U.S. business leader. So uh, we'll get along with the conversation. I'll probably start uh, with a couple of 
fairly general questions, and I assume we'll narrow into some of the particular uh, issues that come up. Um, but I guess I'm curious, just to get it started, to ask you, uh, what are you most worried about? What, what keeps you up at night when you think about um, the issues of fragmentation? And um, maybe start with uh, Commissioner Ansi. I think in Europe, uh, when people, they are thinking about fragmentation, then uh, they are thinking about uh, our uh, European market. Uh, we were able to create a single market in physical meaning, but uh, a digital single market uh, does not exist. Uh, instead, uh, to have a single market uh, with uh, uh, more than 500 million healthy customers, uh, we have 28 uh, uh, really small markets. But uh, this is not about uh, fragmentation of the Internet. Mm. Uh, more globally, talking about fragmentation of the Internet, uh, I think we, we have to deal with uh, Internet governance issues. And in this field, uh, uh, ICANN President uh, Fadi Shekhar uh, made a really good job uh, promoting a multi-stakeholder model of uh, the Internet governance. Uh, um, <coughs> secondly, we have uh, to, to, to set uh, common rules uh, uh, in our continents and then worldwide uh, in the United States and, uh, and in Europe uh, we um, were able to agree in common net neutrality pr principles uh, uh, and uh, I hope the rest of the world uh, will uh, uh, follow us in, in, in this field. Thirdly, I'm worried about uh, uh, data flows. Uh, one of our aims, according to the uh, digital single market strategy in, in Europe, is to allow uh, free data flows across uh, the European Union. But uh, uh, we have to, to create uh, an environment uh, where uh, we can allow free and safe, safe data flows also between EU and, and uh, the third countries. So I'm looking forward quite uh, hopefully, I hope uh, uh, very soon we will be able to, to wrap up those uh, negotiations about uh, uh, safe harbor and, uh, and uh, we will provide uh, a safe environment uh, for uh, free data flows uh, uh, between uh, the European Union and the United States. And I saw the two of you talking for about five minutes back there, so I figured you were wrapping up the negotiations. <laughs> and you'll reveal the result here. So. <laughs> That, that'll, come yeah, the, but, uh, that'll come at the end. Uh, I'm not uh, one of those negotiators, but uh, according to my understanding, uh, we made uh, really remarkable efforts, and uh, this safe harbor uh, is, is uh, something we, we cannot compare with this safe harbor we had in the uh, year 2000. Okay, well, we'll definitely come back to safe harbor. Uh, Secretary Pritzker, what, what's most on your mind when you think of this issue of fragmentation? What, what concerns you the most and what you, has the highest stakes as far as you're concerned? Well, I think if you step back and you think about it, you know, uh, the digital economy for just the G20 alone is greater than about $4 trillion and it's growing at about 8% a year. So this is a really important part of our, our global economy. And we have data con controls being put in place. We have uh, data localization content controls, all of which are threatening a free and open internet. And you know, if you step back and think about it, uh, this is not just about the large company, which obviously uh, is able to have a global footprint, but this is also about the small and medium-sized business that um, is able to start up and in essence go global from almost the beginning. If you take, uh, and, and, and that is very much threatened. And entrepreneurship innovation is a big part of, uh, of what the internet enables. And um, we're very much in the United States promoting a free and open internet, uh, multi-stakeholder approach. Um, we're trying to resolve this. It's absolutely imperative that we keep the internet flowing uh, so that global trade can continue. It yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Brad, from a perspective of a big uh, tech company, Microsoft in, in particular, um, what's, the, what's your major focus on this issue? What are you most concerned about? Well, actually, I think your opening uh, comment captured it well. When the internet was invented, there was this notion that it would be governed by the laws of physics rather than the laws of governments. Mm -hmm. Turned out that governments had a different idea. Um, and it's not unreasonable for them to do so. 
uh, you know, everything on the internet has become so intertwined with everything in the real world uh, that in the year 2016, I think it's important to step back. I don't think you can keep people safe in the real world unless you can keep them safe on the internet. Yeah. And I don't think you can keep people's rights protected in the real world unless you can protect their rights in the internet. So how do we do that? Right. Well, first, we have to do it in a way that builds and even rebuilds trust yeah. among consumers around the world, not just in governments, but, it, but in companies. We need the kind of transparency that will build trust. Mm -hmm. And we need to create laws and legal processes that will work for the internet in the 21st century. And these are times going to require laws that are more similar. It's going to require a healthy respect for each other's jurisdiction. And it's frankly more than anything else, I think, going to require new international legal processes that are designed from the start to work across borders. Great, thanks. And we'll come back to those things. Uh, Chandra, um, feel free to talk about something else, but you've written about the importance of the Internet of Things in, in the future and the interconnectedness. Um, I mean, are you concerned that the fragmentation is going to make it much more difficult um, to have an effective governance and effective system for the Internet of Things? I want to make uh, four points. Sure. The first one is uh, I believe the future of the human race is very much tied to the future of the Internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, Secretary Prisker gave some uh, numbers in terms of the economic opportunity. But if you really look at what the future of the Internet has to offer, it's not only a great uh, economic opportunity, it is probably the only hope for job growth. Mm -hmm. And if you are not going to solve uh, the internet-based issues, we are in for a huge shock because we have moved from internet of information to internet of people to internet of things. Right. And everything is going to emit data. And already there are enough statistics on how much data we are generating every single minute. If you are still not solving the problem related to the internet of people, uh, I think we will miss a huge opportunity mm -hmm. which the big data and all the Internet of Things technologies will provide for creating the future in terms of business model, jobs growth, economic growth, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The more we delay, the more we are going to lose. The third point I want to make is each one of us almost are two individuals. We are citizen mm -hmm. on the one hand, we are netizen on the other hand. As a citizen, we abide by the law of the nation where we belong. Right. As a netizen, we abide by the laws of the internet. And they're slightly different. Internet is pretty much, we, we already used to a pretty open and, and, and globally connected um, uh, netizenship. Now we are suddenly realizing the issues related to data privacy are so huge, we are trying to claw back and then our, our uh, freedom is trying to be controlled. I don't understand it because if you really look at a data privacy issue, it is the same whether you are a US citizen or an Indian or a European citizen. I don't think the issues are the same. I don't understand why different nations have to have different laws. I fully appreciate the need for data privacy, fully appreciate all the protection that is required, yeah. but the problem should not be so complicated. We should really promote the, the, the free internet very quickly. We need to form some kind of uh, uh, basic framework or uh, guideline or whatever it is so that we don't miss out on this opportunity. I think time is distance. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Jose, from the standpoint of a big telecom, which obviously has a significant commercial interest in how the Internet is governed, wh what are you most concerned about um, as we look at this topic? Well, we have a huge list of concerns, but uh, to try to summarize them, uh, we all agree that the Internet needs to be open free and neutral. There is no debate about that. But we need to also understand that the Internet was uh, designed or conceived uh, 25 years ago in a different kind of world. Uh, now the network is different. The network is mostly mobile. As we speak, mobile is exploding worldwide. The way we interact with Internet, keyboards, have, is being replaced by screens. Browsing is being replaced by apps. So the world is changing and technology is changing very rapidly. Uh, and that means that the behavior of people on the internet is evolving, and there is no longer an analogical life and a digital life. There is just one single life, and therefore rights and, uh, and protections needs to be the same. Our major concern is that if we do nothing, mm -hmm. we are headed into a very fragmented internet, but because of things that were not a concern 
25 years ago. Yeah. Internet today is not mutual because if you conceive the network or the handsets as part of the network, handsets speak a proprietary language. We are building, we are heading into the, inter the economy of platforms. Platforms are being built in which customers are, ca are captive. Yeah. It's a feudal internet. Right. Those are vassals. Because in exchange of your privacy, in exchange of your data, you can stay on the platform. But if you want to move, I know you can even build your own house on that platform. Mm -hmm. And you can spend your yeah. money on that platform. But if you want to move to another platform, there is no interoperability. There is interoperability of network, but there is no interoperability of operating systems. You cannot port your digital life from one platform to the other. Yeah. So our concern is that apart from economic interests or business interests, is that if we do nothing, yeah. we are headed into a fragmented internet with feudal lords mm -hmm. that on their, dom on their domain manage the information yeah, in right. certain ways. Right, and, and so you're raising an issue that I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll want to discuss, which is when you talk about the fragmentation of the internet and you talk about the rules, you're, you're talking really about the rules that apply to what we traditionally call the internet with doma domain names. As you get into the world of apps, you're dealing in the world of digital interactivity, but um, you had, you're in a situation where you can have kind of walled gardens that are cut off um, from the rules. Uh, might as well come to that now since you brought it up. I mean, how do people feel about that? Is, is there a way in which the kinds of conversations that are going on involving the internet you know, also apply to apps? And, and how, do, how do apps figure into this conversation? You look at me, so I guess I'll, ha I'll answer. Brad. Um, I, I would start with this. I, I think it actually, before going to apps, it should start with people's information. Uh, and I think that there are some important first principles and that are increasingly finding acceptance, where that's, whether it's in the context of the new European regulation or, say, new international standards like ISO 27018. And it comes down to who owns your data. Uh, I think people own their data. People should own their data. People who build platforms and apps should respect that this data belongs to people. Uh, you know, it's why we've said we will process people's personal information only as they instruct us to do so. And you raise the point, if it's mine, can I move it? If you can move your money from one bank to another, if you can move your phone number from one carrier to another, can you move your information from one provider to another? Um, look, I think either companies will create apps and services that enable that information to move in a re reasonable way, or governments will step in. Uh, I think we do best as an industry when we listen to views of different communities around the world. Um, we pay attention to those views uh, and we take the kinds of responsible steps to meet people's needs. Um, you know, in some ways, we can tell everybody to keep their hands off that this will lead to fragmentation, but the truth is the fastest way to get to fragmentation is to stop listening to what people want and need because that's what forces governments to step in. But I assume, uh, you know, you would agree that app makers sometimes have a different commercial interest than a Microsoft or a, a telecom, and so you're, you're dealing not just with, you know, trying to come together, but you're also dealing with pretty divergent commercial interests. Yeah, but I'll, yeah, absolutely, but look, I'm a, I'm a veteran of the school of hard knocks. Um, you know, Microsoft is, it participates in many different parts of this economy in terms of technology. Uh, we have apps, you know, uh, we have productivity apps. Uh, we have file formats. Uh, there were concerns and complaints a decade ago that the, uh, the file formats didn't enable people to move the documents they had created in Microsoft Word to Google Docs or others. There was a standardization effort. There was a regulatory effort. You know, ultimately, you know, we got the message. We moved, and now that kind of interoperability is possible. I'm sort of from the school that says, look, you either less listen and you get the message, or you wait for somebody to hit you over the head, and that actually hurts. <laughs> okay, yeah, go ahead. I just like uh, uh, to support uh, Brad Smith. Uh, we have to deal with data, data ownership uh, issues. Until now, when we were talking about uh, data, we were mainly talking about data protection. But uh, data as a resource, as a commodity, we didn't pay on those issues so much attention. So uh, in Europe, for example, in, in some countries, uh, 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 patients, our people, they own their personal health records. 
in some other uh, uh, member states, uh, people they uh, are not able even to get copies of, uh, about their personal health records. About what kind of free movement of patients in the European Union we can talk about uh, when people they, they are not able to get copies of uh, their uh, personal health records. In some countries, in Switzerland here, for example, People, they uh, put uh, their personal health records into foundation and, and, and they know that, uh, that uh, this foundation is selling those data to uh, pharmaceutical companies. But they expect uh, one lovely day they will get something which will be really useful for them or their children or for humanity. Mm -hmm. And I myself, I'm also ready to do that. But at first we will have to deal with the data ownership issues. I absolutely agree with you. Um, people, they have to own their data they in, in this meaning that uh, they will uh, have to have access to their data collected about them and they have to get right also to delegate access to data collected about them to th third persons. So, uh, and, and then we will get a lot of valuable apps. Uh, I'm not talking about uh, uh, medicine, uh, to thinking about energy issues. Uh, uh, it's possible to earn uh, or to save 100 billion euros per year if we will be able to cut to those peaks and, and, and lows. But once again, at first we have to deal with data ownership uh, issues and, and we have to allow for free uh, uh, data flows uh, across yeah. the Europe and, <coughs> as I said, across the world. So there are many fragmentation issues. I want to go to one of the, obviously, the key ones, which is governance. Um, the uh, domain name system, uh, ICANN, has been the, uh, the manager of that. That's been, I guess, under contract with the Department of Commerce. It's a relationship with the U.S. government. And that's, that's been evolving, and uh, there have been a lot of negotiations about exactly what the governance is going to be. Um, you know, I, I assume, as most people know, there, there's some desire by some countries to have more um, national control as opposed to the broad multi-stakeholder control. Um, Secretary Pritzker, wh where are we on those conversations and wh what's the future of ICANN? Well, first of all, it, you know, it's our strong position that uh, the technical services that we provide now uh, should be transitioned. Uh, we call it the IANA transition. And uh, we've been working uh, with ICANN on that uh, process. And we very much are looking forward to a proposal that will be made to us uh, and to trying to institute that transition. We are firm believers in the multi-stakeholder process. And I would say you know, the challenge here is this tension between governments and the multi-stakeholder and the individual. And uh, not just on I, I can, but I'm talking more about the issue that, uh, and, and then of course we have entities like businesses uh, and app providers and operating <coughs> system providers or platforms, et cetera. And it, it, is, you know, it would be great to wave a magic wand and come up with one answer. Uh, what's, the problem is not everybody shares the same set of principles about what ought to happen with data and who owns it and how it ought to be uh, managed. The United States has the position that it should be a multi-stakeholder process that manages the internet. Not every country agrees with that. And that's a fundamental tension that exists out there right now. And the ability to do the um, IANA transition will depend upon being able to satisfy that um, the United States, that this will remain, the internet will remain governed by a multi-stakeholder process and not subject to what I call a hostile takeover. But individual countries could opt out, right, and set up their own root service systems and you could have a, an yeah, Iranian internet, you could have a Chinese internet. It's yeah. technically right. Ca uh, right. able to happen. The question is, is that that's your fragment, one aspect of fragmentation that could occur. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on the transition of ICANN or? I think, uh, yeah. I think the, uh, the underlying problem is not who is going to own it and whether yeah. the transition happens. Yeah. It is fundamentally agreeing to those principles. Mm -hmm. We've got to force the issue in terms of uh, what Brad said, data belongs to the, but, but the individual. Second thing is how open it should be. Once you have put it in one app or one platform, you should be freely 
be able to move to another platform with the individual chooses to. So like this, I think, what are the fundamental axioms and principles? We had to force an agreement on that. It, it, it doesn't matter uh, after that who is controlling, etc. The reason we are not able to solve the problem is because there is a disagreement in principles. So uh, we are talking about creating uh, uh, nation, uh, nationwide um, implementations. Then, then you're going to complicate the issue. I mean, of course, governments do have some compelling interests in, in the internet. You, you've got conflicting copyright laws. You have conflicting, conflicting laws on pornography, on, on you know, gambling, who can come to one site or another. Geo-blocking is partly about governments having different laws. How, how do you ultimately, and I know you're dealing with this in Europe, I mean, how do you ultimately reconcile the real differences in how different groups who gather as, as, organ, as, uh, you know, as a people uh, have different values, <coughs> and, and how do you reconcile that when you look at governance of issues such as geo-blocking and not enabling people to um, either to move across country lines or having different rules? Um, Commissioner. So once I, I said uh, I hate geo-blocking, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> it was quite a popular statement, so, uh, because uh, I think uh, we all experienced uh, rerouting. So uh, what does it mean for ordinary people? You know, they are not selling uh, those goods and services from the first uh, place you visited, but uh, they are sending you to another place. And, and then uh, they will deny from services at all or, or say, uh, look for where your credit card is issued. No, no, uh, those services, uh, they are not for you, they are, they are for our people. So uh, what does it mean? If uh, in uh, some EU country, for example, uh, you would like to buy a box of chocolate and that uh, they say that, uh, that uh, it's prohibited uh, to eat uh, those candies, for example, in, in Switzerland, uh, they, you think uh, those people, they, they are um, a little bit crazy. But in, uh, in digital world, we say well, this is basis of our business model. Why we have to accept discrimination on basis of uh, your nationality or where your credit card uh, was issued uh, on the 21st century in the European Union? So we will deal with those uh, uh, geo-blocking issues, but uh, uh, I agree uh, uh, there can be also justified uh, geo-blocking when uh, people they, or countries that uh, they have to, to protect their uh, legal systems, uh, then we can talk about uh, justified uh, uh, geo-blocking, for example, in, if in one country, uh, uh, for example, is, uh, uh, this online gambling is, uh, is allowed and in another country it's prohibited, then uh, uh, geo-blocking to protect legal systems uh, is, uh, is acceptable even according to my understanding. But uh, uh, geo-blocking uh, uh, caused by copyright restrictions, it's, it's a huge problem. We, in Europe at least, we uh, made our uh, portability proposal in, uh, in December already. Uh, we have to allow uh, legal access to the, the legally bought digital content uh, to our people even when they are traveling in some other EU countries. Today, we know that 35% uh, of Europeans are spending at least 10 days during the year in another EU member state. And many of those people would like to get uh, access to their legally bought digital content, but because of copyright restrictions, they cannot. So, it, since 15th of June uh, 2017, we will abolish roaming surcharges in the European Union, and more and more people in Europe would like to start to use their mobile devices, and then they will have choice, either legal access to digital content or they will continue to, to use VPN and, and uh, free downloads. According to public opinion polls, uh, today 20% uh, of internet users in the European Union are using VPN to get uh, access to digital content. 68% of film viewers said that uh, they are using so-called free downloads. We have to create win-win situation uh, where people, they can have legal access uh, to digital content. Uh, they will pay for that uh, if, uh, as they are paying today uh, for VPN, six, eight, ten euros per month, 20 euros per three months, etc. But 
we have also to remunerate uh, uh, creators. They have to, uh, to get uh, a fair remuneration. And uh, yeah, uh, we have to deal with those issues in Europe. But uh, I don't think uh, uh, this is a real issue in, in the European Union. And in uh, other continents, uh, we, we can see how people, they are facing uh, similar challenges. Maybe we should just kind of hit the safe harbor dead on now so we can see what's going on because we do have an opportunity. Um, so, I mean, the state of play, European Court of Justice struck down the prior safe harbor rule that allowed the transfer of personal data of EU citizens to the U.S. if they agreed to adequate privacy protections. There have been a series of negotiations since then to come up with a new um, safe harbor agreement. There was supposed to be a new agreement, at least based on what I've read, as of January 31st. Um, Turning to both of you, are, are you making progress? And where exactly are you on it? And when do we, when should we expect a resolution? Maybe I'll start. Um, you know, let's put this in context. We've actually been working on a new safe harbor framework for over two years, the United States and the uh, European Commission. So this is not a new endeavor just since the uh, European Court of Justice decision. And um, I think that <coughs> uh, we've leaned forward uh, to try and address um, the EC and the um, uh, European uh, Court of Justice concerns. And so we have a comprehensive offer that we're refining right now um, that creates what's called essential equivalence, which is the standard that needs to be met in order for Safe Harbor to um, receive what's called an adequacy determination. That's kind of the bar that we have to hit. Um, there's a couple of issues that are of real interest. The first is the national security issue. You know, what, are, um, what kind of information is available about uh, activities uh, done for national security and how do those affect privacy? And our uh, intelligence community and law enforcement have detailed for uh, the EC the legal authorities and oversight uh, that has been put in place, particularly uh, uh, post-Snowden with the presidential directive. Uh, and so that uh, includes privacy protections for um, citizens of all nations. And it very much aligns with the requirements of the European Court of Justice. Um, the other big issue is the issue of how to address if a European citizen has a complaint about privacy. And um, we've taken that issue very seriously. It's a very important issue and one that we, we take privacy very seriously in the United States and we take the issue of addressing this very seriously. And we've developed multiple, seven pathways for uh, EU citizens to address their concerns about compliance. So there's, um, you know, and then we've developed significant also new frameworks and commitments from U.S. agencies to provide enforcement and resolve uh, these complaints using our FTC, which drives privacy now. <coughs> um, but let's keep in mind something really fundamental. For the last 15 years, oh, almost 4,500 companies from both sides of the Atlantic have benefited from Safe Harbor. In those 15 years, there have been four referrals from EU data protection agencies to our FTC uh, for unresolved uh, complaints about privacy. And all of those got resolved. So we're at a point where the big issues, I think, are um, it's time for us to act and to stand together. and. And to demonstrate to companies and to the European Court of Justice and to all interested stakeholders that we've come a very long way. The other thing to keep in mind is that there's an annual review of the safe harbor that's now built in. So we have to recognize that all of these good folks are evolving technology probably faster than governments can react. But we've set up mechanisms to recognize that the landscape will change and that the solutions today will have to evolve. And so I think it's actually, back to your first question, which is, you know, how do we get there and, and how do we begin to set up uh, uh, mechanisms and ecosystems? 
I think different parts of the world have to act and lead. And I think that the US and EU with safe harbor can lead on privacy, recognizing the evolution that will occur by our innovators. I think that trade agreements is another mechanism for us to deal with this fragmentation and digital economy. And using those types of mechanisms, there will be groups of countries that will choose to lead. And then we'll see what happens. We'll see who's better off, depending you know, on the structures that they choose. I don't think we're unfortunately going to get to one solution right out of the box. I just think that's not the way the world is working. Um, are there sticking points that you're uh, concerned about in these negotiations? Yes, uh, uh, of course. Me too. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward optimistically and, uh, and I'm confident uh, we will be able to reach consensus. As we remember, uh, we got the safe harbor uh, in the year 2000 already and the idea was good to protect the uh, data of our citizens uh, in the United States of America. But uh, uh, in the year 2013, uh, we got to this understanding that uh, that safe harbor wasn't uh, safe enough because of uh, uh, Prism, uh, Snowden, etc. And already then uh, we made our 13 proposals and then we started to negotiate uh, on basis of, of those proposals. Uh, in January 2014, President uh, Barack Obama made a really remarkable a speech when where he stated that that, that uh, all the data it doesn't matter data of uh, Europeans or or non-Europeans have uh, to be treated uh, uh, on on equal basis uh, in the United States and I would like to say all those negotiations they uh, followed the same uh, principle and now uh, I think according to new safe uh, safe harbor uh, how we will call this. Uh, a new safe harbor. Uh, really, uh, data of uh, Europeans uh, will, will be treated on equal terms with the uh, data of uh, the data about, uh, collected about Americans uh, in the United States. Not, uh, we cannot compare this safe harbor we will have, uh, I uh, hope we will have, uh, with uh, this safe, har uh, safe harbor we had in the year 2000. Now there will be more transparency. Uh, we will set the uh, uh, institution of ombudsman, uh, then uh, 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 <coughs> distribute, uh, uh, dispute uh, uh, resolution mechanism, uh, then um, which is really important uh, according to my understanding. Uh, it will be a, a, a process mm -hmm. uh, to make safe harbor even more safe uh, because uh, there will be a review, annual, annual review and um, Yet, yeah, I, I would like to say that, uh, that uh, we made progress and uh, we have to wrap up uh, those uh, uh, negotiations and, uh, and we have to deliver and because time is running out, of course. It's so easy to ask for more. Americans, uh, they would like to get more. Europeans, uh, they would like to, to, to get more. But, but time is running out and, uh, and we have to take care about our citizens, about our, our businesses. Uh, we, we have to, to uh, allow those free and, and safe data flows also between our two continents. I hate to sound like a journalist, but it sounds like you're not quite there if you say we, time, time is running out. <laughs> yeah, it, it, <laughs> When I said that, uh, that according to my understanding, uh, yeah. according to this uh, new safe, safe harbor, uh, <coughs> uh, data of uh, uh, European citizens will be treated uh, as state of Americans in the United States of America, uh, 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 then it, it means something. Uh, we really made efforts. So if there will be some kind of doubts, then uh, uh, this review uh, clause, uh, yeah. it makes sense. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 yeah, I asked for bullet bulletproof uh, uh, solution, but uh, if it will be not bulletproof, uh, then uh, uh, we can be absolutely sure uh, the European Court for Court of Justice will uh, intervene once again. Okay. So okay. this is a process. Okay. Any other comments on this? Yes. Well, I, I would say, speaking from the outside, not being privy to all the details, but thinking about this from a technology perspective, it's an issue that is both fraught with peril, but also ripe with opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fraught with peril because we have 11 days and the transatlantic economy as a whole is dependent on a successful outcome. 
American companies employ 3.8 million people in the European Union. EU companies do $2 trillion worth of sales in the United States. These negotiations are too important to fail. Yeah. But the opportunity is equally interesting, and it's worth reflecting on it. Because there is a real opportunity here to resolve this in a way that advances trust in technology and each other's governments. Yeah. On the surveillance issue, first of all, I, I very strongly believe that President Obama deserves a lot of credit for putting the United States on a path towards surveillance reform, first in 2014 with more transparency. The US Congress ended bulk collection in 2015. And yet there is room for more transparency steps. And if the two governments can find a way to do that, that will benefit the economy and transparency and even trust mm -hmm. in the United States. On the other side, and it may seem odd to hear a company say this, but if people in Europe are going to trust American companies, we need to be accountable. People yeah. will not trust institutions that are not accountable. Privacy is a fundamental human right. Rights need to have remedies. Remedies need to be real and effective. And if the FTC can and does act, that can give people confidence. And if the FTC doesn't act in a particular situation, I don't know that that means that there should be no role for local data protection authorities. On the other hand, I think what not just the US tech sector, but US companies, large and small, across the economy are looking for from Europe is a measure of regulatory clarity yep. and coherence. Mm -hmm. And I think we in the United States should give Europe some credit. Because in the context of the new general data protection regulation, there are new measures to create a consistency mechanism. That's a building block. And if a negotiation can lead to an outcome where American companies, large and small, will know who it is that they're accountable to, that would be a huge victory, yeah. Yeah. I believe, for the cause of commerce and privacy. And I believe that if these kinds of steps were to come together, I think the tech sector would speak loudly and clearly and publicly and supportively for both the United States government and the European Commission for solving this problem in a way that not just puts the crisis behind us, mm -hmm. but creates a less fragmented internet. So, so we haven't heard from anybody from a, uh, a non-developed nation, so I, although you, have, you run a large multinational, to, to take, take us through it a bit from your perspective. I think it is not only a US-European uh, uh, commission issue. Um, it is an issue for the world. If you take India, it's the same issue. The, the platform could be run out of India. It could have access to US uh, citizens' data, European citizens' data. In fact, funnily enough, uh, that day when this uh, judgment came. That afternoon, uh, Chancellor Merkel was in India, and we had the joint CEO meeting between Germany and, and Prime Minister Modi. So uh, Prime Minister Modi, uh, Chancellor Merkel, and all of us were sitting there. So each of the sides were raising an issue. I raised the issue saying, uh, you know, we don't have a safe border with Europe, and all our clients need it, we need it, and we have it with the United States. United States, United States has it with the European Union. We don't understand why we have it. And soon after that lunch, this news about the cancellation of the safe harbor yeah. came about. So it is, it is a global issue. It's definitely an issue that has implications beyond European Union, because the software platforms are platforms. Analytics is going to happen anywhere from the world. These platforms have got access to global data. Uh, we're almost ready to go to the audience, but I just want to ask Jose a quick um, technology question, because one of the ways the internet can be fragmented is if some people have a way better in better internet than other people, and there's a lot of work being done on the 5G networks, which will take us to another level. Um, could you give us uh, any sense of where the work is being done, uh, where we are in the 5G development? Well, 5G is going to be here somewhere between uh, 2018 and 2020, and it's going to... 2018 and 2020? Uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to imply a massive change, because it's going to... The major issue is not going to be just the speed of access or significant jump in speed, or even in capacity, is going to probably be ending with latency. And latency means that uh, the, the rate of interaction between the Internet of Things is going to be eliminated, and therefore it's going to be a real-time thing. Yeah. So if we are concerned about security uh, in a world of a few smartphones, I mean, or some penetration of a smartphone and individual data, 
think about a world in the next five years in which all of our clothes, our glasses, our cars, our fridges, our right. you know, gas meter, water meter, electrical meters, uh, yeah. microwaves, uh, everything is going to be connected to internet and it's going to be generated information. So if we were concerned about personal information, yeah. think about your blood pressure, your mood, uh, your uh, um, travel uh, right. uh, patterns or your food. So my point is the following. We have discussed a little bit about who is the owner of the data. We should not waste much time on that. The owner is the customer. It is their data. It's his life. And therefore, we need to think who is ready to present in front of the customer all the data that we have on, on them. Because it should be them deciding what to do with their data. Yeah. Yeah. So it should be them deciding what's the limit of the usage that is. And we can regulate or try to regulate in my opinion, should be same service, same rule. I am totally on for less regulation because I think, uh, uh, so I, and I think we all should be treated the same. But in my personal opinion, this is going much faster than yeah. regulation. Yeah. Customers are deciding. Ad blockers, as we speak, are literally booming, yeah. booming. Yeah. And this is going to be a massive change because all the ar algorithms that are being elaborated today are thought or designed for a continuous function. And the customer is going to convert that into discrete functions. Yeah. So in my opinion, uh, I think we should go very fast because we will be building the networks. Yeah. The customers are going to be using those networks. And we are ready to put all the data that we have on our customers in front of them so they can act. In our opinion, they should be able to block the geolocalization. They should be able to block the signaling. They should be able to on and off. Yeah. And it should be them <coughs> running their own digital life as they run their own life. Yeah. Uh, but, but you'd also say that 5G increases the urgency of getting some principles to solve some of these issues in advance. 4G is already there, right, but yeah. 5G is going to make it even yeah. more urgent. Right. I mean, exactly, uh, right. Um, let's open it up uh, to a broader conversation. Um, and uh, do we do microphones or? Yeah. OK, uh, so over here. Thank you. This, um, can you hear me? This question is for, for Commissioner Ansep. Um, so you referenced the Snowden documents as being one of the key, and the revelations in those documents as being one of the key uh, points that made you uncomfortable with the previous safe harbor agreement and the European Court of Justice certainly uh, referenced it as well. But one of the other revelations that was in those documents is what other European intelligence agencies are doing, which in sometimes far exceeds the NSA's capabilities and authorities, yet I have heard nothing about the concern about the inner European data transfers to some of those countries. How do you address this inconsistency? Yes, but the this is uh, this is totally uh, different issue, uh, uh, not connected with with the safe harbor. But uh, of course, uh, as I said already, uh, some uh, politicians, some people, they would like uh, to ask uh, uh, much more for, uh, from America than uh, they are ready to provide uh, uh, themselves. So this is an issue, but uh, mm, we don't have uh, cases uh, uh, talking about mass surveillance in uh, in the European Union. And uh, people in Europe, of course, they have to be absolutely sure that, uh, that uh, uh, this national security exception is, is, uh, is uh, really used in uh, very exceptional cases, not for mass surveillance. Okay. We have a question back here. can't really see behind me, but go ahead. Uh, I very, very much sympathize with your perspective that the Internet today consists of feudal communities with feudal lords and serfs without uh, civil rights, uh, and if you want, like, owning their data. And I think a key problem, if you want to give people their civil rights, is to know who they are. And the uh, UN and the World Bank have a project to deploy electronic ideas worldwide by 2030. Uh, and the question is, what do we do until then, and what do we do when everyone has electronic ideas so that we can give them their rights? Well, it's, uh, in our opinion, is relatively easy to explain, hard to, do, to execute. We have the carriers, the telecom operations, we have huge amount of data, much more data than any other company uh, on, on our customers, but we are, bu we are buying by law to protect this data. Uh, we are legally responsible for the custodian, we are the custodian of those data. The, the issue that we have is that, you know, data is like the oil of 21st century, if we do nothing, this oil is going to be drilled and transferred somewhere to some platforms. It's going to be refined and send it back for value to the customers who are the end of the owners of those data, and that happens to be nothing in, in, as a counterpart. 
in our opinion, we need to put in front of the customer, who is the owner of this data, all the information that we have on them. All of, all of that. And we are ready to do that. We are ready to tell them where they move around through geolocalization, how many, what's their pattern of behavior on the internet through uh, signaling, what is their video at, uh, appetites, I mean, uh, because of the products and service platform like video, machine to machine, or e-health or financial services. We are ready to give that back to them because they are already paying us for that. It is their information, it is their oil. And they should be deciding to whom they want to transfer that oil to be refined and what's the price of that oil. And the, we can do that through the ID of the customer because we have the ID of the customer. So at least on our side, and we have no issue at all of interconnecting our information, our platform with the platform on other telco, and therefore if my customer moves from Telefonica to other platform, I wish they would not be doing that, but if for some reasons they would be willing to do that, they can bring their data with them. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and it's around the ID of the customer. Well, they know much better than what we think, because, I mean, it, the, the advertising and the algorithms are evolving so rapidly that they know a lot. We might be knowing more because of the billing or the customer care or the video, whatever, but they know a lot. My point here is that as soon as the customer is going to be acting on that information, the algorithms are going to change because the, the flow of information is going to not be continuous. It's going to be discrete. And therefore, I want my customer to be on command of his data. Because the sooner they do that, the sooner they would start acting on that. And the sooner the ecosystem would balance. I want interoperability of operating system. I want interoperability of the digital life. I want same service, same rule. And competing with WhatsApp for a voice over IP. And WhatsApp is not even regulated. I'm not advocating for WhatsApp to be regulated. But then let's deregulate me. I mean, uh, same service, same rule. Those are the kind of things that we are proposing because we think that's good for the customer who at the end of the day, you know, nobody can hide on the internet. And the customer is already acting through ad blocking and through moving around. So my view is that sovereignty, we need to give the citizen the sovereignty of the digital life. And it's very easy. If I could, because I think it's an incredibly thought-provoking question that is worth reflecting on. And I say this not to comment on Facebook, which I think is a terrific and responsible company, but just go back to the way you framed the question. You know, we live in a world that fundamentally is being driven by both economic globalization, but also a response where people in communities want to maintain their local culture and, and a degree of local control. The internet is a wonderful thing, but people don't want to lose control to what I might describe as sort of you know, a new generation and era of digital sovereigns that are accountable only to the laws of physics. That's not what people want. Mm -hmm. So then you have to ask, then to whom are those of us in the tech sector accountable? Well, once you ask that question, it becomes clear. We're accountable to governments and their laws. But governments exist around territories. And as soon as governments pass laws that differ from territory to territory, you create the risk of fragmentation. So fundamentally, I think what this whole topic is about and what much of the fourth industrial revolution topic is about is how to reconcile these competing themes. And ultimately, I think it requires that, first of all, those of us who are in this sector and others really listen and figure out how to meet the needs of the world even when people in different parts of the world define their needs in different ways. I think second, we really have to think through how we create laws that are designed for the, at least the second or third decade of this century, how we create laws and processes that cross borders, how we ensure, frankly, that governments respect each other's borders, but how data moves because without data moving amidst all of this, then the very economic impetus that is driving growth forward begins to be weighed down. Thank you. Other thoughts? As I think you silenced the crowd with your, elo <laughs> with your eloquence there. Any other questions or comments? Okay, um, then I'll sum up. Um, 
uh, you know, good, good discussion around something where one knew from the beginning that you couldn't resolve the issues or even perhaps address um, all of them. Um, but, you know, what I, among the things I come away with, uh, you know, is certainly a sense of urgency uh, that the issues uh, need to address, a sense that uh, there's a preference for a multi-stakeholder model at, to the extent that that, uh, that can be done. Um, that um, there's obviously a lot of money at stake and there's a lot of question of, of growth at stake. And I think uh, there's also a question of, uh, which we didn't get into in much detail, but there's a, there's a question of, of um, equity, economic equity involved too, because you certainly don't want to leave out uh, large portions uh, of the world's population. Um, clearly the stakes are high for the fourth uh, industrial revolution, so we kind of four and five of our big numbers and it's get, get higher as you get into a 5G world. Um, where uh, everything's moving faster and everything's even more interconnected and the, the notion that we want to try to talk through and resolve as many of the issues uh, now as we can because uh, the, the need for it's just going to uh, accelerate and, and get really crazy uh, perhaps as early as 2018 uh, to, to 2020. Um, I think I heard some optimism that we're heading in the right direction on some issues. Um, I think I heard that we're almost there on safe harbor. I'm, I'm not 100% not sure, but I think I heard that we're, we're feeling optimistic and that there's progress being made there. Um, and uh, I think broadly there's uh, you know, optimism, I think, because uh, I think people feel that the, um, uh, the right thing to do is really kind of out there, that um, despite the fact that there are some different inter uh, interests, um, that uh, the economic growth and, and a sense of uh, uh, fulfilling the needs of people who use uh, the internet really push towards a less fragmented internet as much as we can and, and rules that, uh, uh, that, that crisscross. But I think Brad's uh, points are very well taken about uh, you know, the continuing conflict between the, the notion of the, of, of the global um, internet and, and, and the real and legitimate interests of both individuals and individuals who organize themselves into countries and governments representing them. Um, but but I, I do come away with uh, you know quite an optimistic sense that uh, there's a lot of work being being done in this area and there's uh, you know a decent amount of commitment uh, to making progress there. So I do want to thank the panelists who are you know extraordinarily well qualified to discuss this and for all of you uh, for engaging in the conversation and for those of you who have participated in in Twitter and 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 thanks for being here. Thank you.